And we're back with episode one, part two, featuring Winnie C, the guy who raped the Bengal. Woo! Or boo him. No, boo. Uh, I don't want to cheer for that. Oh, no. boo. But you That's do want to hear me talk about it more, right? So Yes, I would, like, I would love to hear you talk about it more. Okay. All right. So let's just jump right into it. Okay. So we're going to go to March of 1942. The Japanese have invaded uh, Myanmar, which at the time was known as Burma. Um, and it cut off a lot, a huge supply of cheap rice that would feed India's poor population. The Japanese started stationing forces on India's eastern border. And the uh, war cabinet in England responded by... Um, what did they do? They pulled huge quantities of food and raw materials away from Bengal in order to deny them to the enemy in the event of an invasion. So this is just in case Japan actually invades. You don't want them to have food. Um, that is so fucked oh. up. That right. is so fucked up. Right. So that the, what's happening is you're starving Indians now. This is how it starts. It really so seems like they didn't have to do that. They did not. And there's a lot more that really they didn't se- have to do. It really seems like they did not have to do that. That's, that's like a pretty shitty excuse. It's like, well, if we give you food... And then bad guys come and take it. Then the bad guys will have food. The thing is, this food was already there. The, Indi- the Indians already had the food. This is before mm. the starvation happened again. So the mm, food is okay. taken away. They pulled barges off from the sea that would supply more food uh, because they needed, uh, like, they needed ships. It was less efficient to have ships out there. So the price of food in India started to skyrocket, and and this is where uh, this is what a modern oh, famine is like it's not because there's a lack of food there's tons of food it's just denying access of yeah, the food. That, that is 100 percent a man-made famine it's yeah. absolutely what man-made yeah. famine. so indians already wanted to be a dominion and have greater independence for years and millions of them were totally excited to not fight in this stupid war that wasn't even about them um and especially for england and then um they started doing the national disobedience, civil disobedience in 1942 to protest the colony being forced to take part in the war. They didn't want to go die for a white man. Like, mm. it's not a thing. But the British War Council ordered Gandhi and all of the nationalist leaders to be thrown in jail. And this sparked a minor uprising, which England uh, solved by murdering 10,000 people protesting um, during the reprisals. Good look. Good look. Uh, What's great, England? Yeah. Aren't you better than the Nazis? Isn't that shooting, what you were saying? Shooting protesters. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like what they did in South Africa. Okay, uh, but yeah. So, oh, and like everywhere. Oh man, everywhere. It's just people love killing do. protesters. Yeah. Um. Even <clears throat> now. <laughs> Palestine. Yeah. The great bunch of return. It's just happening everywhere. Yep. Uh, but yeah. So now, um, there's blockades, possible starvation. India knows this is going to happen, and uh, Winston Churchill decided to put uh, the lizard brain prof in charge of figuring this all out because you know he's really good with people. Um, so, lizard brain prof, nice. Yeah, it's just I don't know why he chose this guy, but it's because he's his best friend or whatever. Just so, picturing him like sitting down with Churchill, and Churchill's like sipping his like champagne, and he's just like eating crickets. <laughs> Well, he was actually a vegetarian. Flies into his mouth. Oh, right. Okay, okay. Right. Prof is a vegetarian. Okay. But even and though just he's like a vegetarian, grass or something, I don't know. Even though he's a vegetarian, he wanted to make sure that every British person had enough meat, more than enough meat to eat. Man, fucking vegetarians, eh? Like Hitler too. Aren't you a vegetarian? What is up with that? I mean, yes, I am. <laughs> but see, I don't trust. I don't trust him. So you don't trust yourself? Okay. Yeah. You know oh, what? Least of all, I trust myself. <laughs> so they just wanted to make sure everyone had huge rations of meat and huge rations of everything else. Um, He was micromanaging the British diet. Um, So extra loads of beef, just tons of ships that should have been shipping food to India because they are about to be starving, was shipping meat, just tons of beef, 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 beef to England. And um, and the prof being the, the dipshit that he is, was just like, also he hates poor British people, decided that everyone needed a certain ration of beer. So, Every man would have a ration of five pints a day, and every woman, two pints a day. Inequality at, at work again. Yeah. Yeah. The, no, the no, beer sorry, gap. I the numbers wrong. Every man <laughs> would ration 10 pints of beer a day, and every woman, five pints of beer a day. Wow. So the men are drinking five liters of beer just to ten, keep them stupid. Wait, 10 pints, you said? 10 pints a day. That's a that's too much. <laughs> think about Think about, like, what is required to make beer, right? Yeah. There, there's hops, barley, malt. Yeah. These are ingredients that could go into other food. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, yeah. India could have used, but no, 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 just gotta keep England drunk as fuck so they don't wow. question anything. 
So that's what's happening. They literally around. would rather feed their own people poison than help uh, yeah. Indians. So, oh, yeah. like, like these people in England are like get, like having like beef Wellington for the tenth time that week. You're like again, <laughs> like oh, this is worse. There's people starving. Yeah. yeah like, also, you gotta eat, wear all yeah. these diamonds. It's like they're, they're, they're nice, but there's too many of them. <laughs> I'm gonna wear ten rings. Oh, I think I'm weird. <laughs> so now England's plan was to stockpile food, you know, because just in case England. Right. Okay. Yeah. This is, yeah. Yeah. So now all the food's being shipped out. Um, now there was a, a, a Lindemann's chief assistant was a, a guy named McDougal or McDougal or something like that. Uh, and he crunched the numbers and he had like a soul, I guess. And he was like, hey, you probably shouldn't be doing this much diverting because. Uh, Lindemann wanted to reduce all of the food supplies going into Indi India to 60%. And his assistant was At like, this point, he wanted to do that. Yes. Oh, my and God. Jesus his assistant Christ. was like, hey, maybe we could do max lower to 80%. That's the most we can do without hurting all of India because they need this really badly. And then Lindemann did this weird like thing where he haggled lower. He's like, what about 30% then? I was like, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. <laughs> that will kill them. So then his assistant finally agreed to 60%, even though his assistant was saying this is not a good idea. His assistant is a white British guy. If a white British guy who's never been to India is able to say this, it, you know, it's what I'm saying is that it's not just the time period that makes you racist. Being racist makes you racist. Yeah. Uh, is, is what I, I think is the point of that. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, so he was trying to go for 40% and the 50. Um, and then so... Uh, there, there's a, a article that I have here. It's called The Most Popular Scientist Ever. And I'm going to show you the article real quick, just for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, watch all of these things. I cut it out because it's just so damn long. I'm so sorry this is going this long. But so, it's okay. Hey, I'm it's having okay. blasts. It's okay. What do you mean, sorry? All right. So this is The Most Powerful Scientist Ever, Winston Churchill's personal technocrat. And this fucking article is about... That motherfucker, the prof. And the prof. The prof. I think I was just hoping there was a picture of him so we could make fun of his face, but uh, oh. I guess there is not. Does he right. have a very stupid looking face? <laughs> <laughs> have you seen I it? Feel like, yes, I had a picture uh, oh. lined up actually. Let me find where I put that find one. It. I want to see it. I want to see this guy. I this bet you has like a fucking huge, like jutting jaw, like the, oh, like the biggest fucking underbite. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Just, mm. No, wow. he doesn't have a Habsburg jaw. Is that what it's called? You're, right, you're wow. describing a Habsburg jaw, which we could do an episode on the Habsburgs, <laughs> but I don't think that has <laughs> much to do with the colonialism I want to talk about, but more about inbreeding. Um, okay. But you guys, you know what I'm talking about, right? No, never mind. I'll just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like this like royal family that was like inbred so much that oh, they just. Oh, one of like, those? Yeah. So this is Fuckface McGee. Fuck, fucky. Oh. Fuck you, Lindemann. Yeah, piece of you know, shit. You know, this, you know this is fucked? This is fucked? I'm a tradesperson as well, right? And this guy looks exactly like my training coordinator. Oh, yeah. 100% <laughs> like my training coordinator. That's him. He's fucking freaking me out, Take man. his own death. Oh, no. Canada. I'm taking a picture of this, and I'm showing this to him tomorrow, I swear. <laughs> Lindemann. Lindemann. Just like the fucking greasiest British old guy ever. He's a professor. He's very intelligent. He's very smart. Ooh, he does I'm not a give a fuck about human beings and is very, very, very racist. According to my professional calculations, we should <laughs> produce right. a man-made famine on these brown people. But they, no they, they're not calling it that yet, or ever, really. They don't think they ever admit that they created right. it. They will always blame the Indians for We're this. the first ones. Man-made famine, baby. Yeah. We're to here first. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to quote the article, The Most Powerful Scientist Ever. Um, uh, so this was born like one of Churchill's far-reaching decisions on January 2nd, 1943. The prof informed the prime minister that the United Kingdom's imports would increase by a million tons if the 90 monthly sailings to the east were cut to 50 during January, February, March, and why 1.25 million tons of the cut were to 40 sailings. 
Moreover, the gain would be increased to three and a half millions if the cut were prolonged up until June. So they're saying cut all the deliveries to India to get more food back into England. Okay. Mm. So a more nuanced calculation yeah. taking into account the delay in transferring ships from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic would find that the last cut actually yielded two million tons of imports. Failing such strong actions, factories would have to close down for lack of materials with all the political repercussions this involved. So now they're worried about business. You know, we're open for business, like the way Ford would say. You want to keep business booming? This memo didn't give other options of maybe cutting it down to 80% and also what would happen if you keep cutting it down lower and lower and lower. And so uh, the assistant McDougal ended up suggesting 60% because he was kind of strong-armed into it by Lindemann and sent that to Churchill. And Churchill decided to go for 44% because we need to protect England as much as possible. That wasn't even a number that was one, suggested. Two, it's basically a death sentence, okay? Oh, so, yeah. So most of the British shipping to India pulled away to service England. The lack of shipping had wide-ranging effects and it destroyed the Indian economy, which was already kind of destroyed from the damage done because the Japanese invaded Burma and because they weren't mm. getting any trade from that end. And then further yeah. fucking the economy was the mass of English debt to India because England owed India so much at this point. So yeah. now India is technically very wealthy on paper, but it doesn't have any of that wealth. These loans are not due yet. They're not going to do until, I guess, after the fucking war or something stupid. So mm -hmm. this causes inflation. People are printing more money. Uh, so from the book uh, that I was talking about before, Mukherjee um, says she cites a historian named Barron's who uh, wrote a study on wartime British shipping. And Barron's wrote that after the prof's advice was enacted, uh, the menace of famine suddenly loomed up like a hydra-headed monster with a hundred clamoring mouths. And this didn't just affect India, obviously. Uh, it also affected various African countries like Somalia and Kenya. Um, they all suffered famines in 1943. Um, India's was just one of the biggest ones. Oh, boy. This conversation is making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and with oh, that, no. we'll go to our sponsor, uh, <laughs> McDonald's? No. Wonder, Wonder Bread. bread. Wonder Bread. Hey. <laughs> oh. Um, so let's see where we're at. Um, so these famines are occurring. Oh, but guess what? There's no famine in the United Kingdom. Why? Imagine that. They have That's a weird. shit ton of food that they're not even using. Not at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. They're just hoarding it. Like the way people hoarded toilet paper at the beginning of the, the pandemic. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. Except yeah. for with a whole country. And yeah. instead of toilet yeah. paper, stuff you can eat. You can eat toilet paper. You can't eat gesture, you can eat toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being too judgy. People are yeah. like, excuse me? It's my it's favorite. Like, like my strange addiction situation, you know? Just right, like, right, right, right. <laughs> I'm addicted to eating toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm addicted yeah. to eating, and it's like, if Where I do don't eat, eat, I'll die. <laughs> Where do you even go? Is there? Do they have meetings for that? I don't know. I think you just have I, to go to the like Narcotics Anonymous one and then like stand up in the middle of uh, heroin users and be like, mine's a little bit different. <laughs> you just go to a famine and all right. So them. everything you guys are saying, it tracks. Like I get it, but mine isn't really quite. It's not with the same thing. <clears throat> okay, so back to this. Uh, it, it's it's we're in July thirtieth of nineteen forty three. The War Cabinet received a desperate request for grain from the Viceroy of India, another white guy from England who's there being like, yo, send food back, people are dying. Not him, obviously, but people around him. So he actually gave a fuck about the poor, um, you know, because there's a huge, massive famine that's happening uh, that started in Bengal and in Southern India. So a general unrelated to the Viceroy, another person warned the, the council that India might stop being useful as a base uh, if people starve to death, you know? He's trying to appeal to the way England is looking at it financially, being like, you know, you want to make money, but can you really get money from dead people? Right? Um, okay. So this is when the prof said some bullshit. He didn't consider this a serious problem. Uh, he also doubted that there was a food shortage. He loudly doubted whether or not the import of cereals should or could play a role in alleviating the famine. He pointed so out that India had almost suffered a famine in 1942, but things were fine in the end. Right. Uh, he, he also noted that the harvest that year had been huge, yet there was a total failure to provide half a million tons of cereal. No, yet we are told that 
Failure to provide a half ton, of, a half million tons of cereals will result in the reduction of national output, refusal to export food, famine conditions, civil disturbance, and subversive activity among the troops of the Indian Army. Now, again, the food is being produced. India is creating enough food, moreover, to feed its country a few times, but the food's being shipped out. And no food is being shipped in to replace it. And it's like, did he have his head under a rock? Or is he just a racist? I don't know. Uh, in this episode of Is It Just Racist or Is He Stupid? Uh, I think it's racism. I think it's racism, yeah. yeah. Let's see. So like maybe, maybe both. <laughs> He's a guy they call the prof, all right? He knows <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, yeah. He knows so what he's doing. This is what he claimed or he theorized. Indians were hoarding food. Which is what England was actually doing. Cool, cool. Like, Victim blaming. Is, awesome. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, love it. There are wealthy Indians who are hoarding all the food, and if they just shared with the poor people, it'd be fine. That's his theory. And he decided that and really believed that selfish people should start relieving their like, you know, sharing their stockpiles of grain that they obviously have to to really fix the famine that might happen, but isn't happening yet. But again, the viceroy and the general that were coming back. We're saying, okay, it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. Also, it is happening. People are dying. So the prof ended a memo on the subject of the Indian famines by pointing out that the upcoming liberation of Italy, freeing Italy from Nazis or like, sorry, from Mussolini, um, would require even more of India's shipping in order to feed those white civilians. And thus diverting more shipping to stop the famine in India was scarcely seems justified unless the Ministry of War Transport cannot find any other use for it. So no grain was sent. Because you got to redirect that food to the white people that are about to be freed. Right? That's, racism. That's not even hiding racism at that point. <laughs> nope. Okay. So on November 10th, 1943. The these guys yeah. had a lot. These guys, you know, if they really sat down with Hitler, they'd have a lot in common. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. It's like, we're better than you, but by like 30, but we're better than you by like 10%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Also very anti-Semitic, as I understand. I know that Lindemann and Churchill were also anti-Semitic. So I don't mm -hmm. know what makes them. I mean, okay. And, and our awesome. our guy in sorry, this is a little bit off topic, but our guy uh, Mackenzie King in Canada, he fucking loved Hitler. He thought Hitler was fucking awesome. He was a fan. Well, Fuck. that's great to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can see it. Yeah. There's a there's an interesting uh like historical what if. Uh what if Hitler hadn't invaded Russia? Uh if he'd just gone uh west instead and uh Russia didn't get involved in the war until later, until they had to. Um at that point, like after you know they'd invaded Paris, would the US join with England and the Allies, or would they join with Nazi Germany? Because if you look at their shit before the war, it seems almost more likely that they'd be more in favor of fascism. Also, without Russia, beating the Nazis would be impossible. Yeah, no. Uh, Absolutely yes. impossible. No, they they, they did the by far the, the biggest part of the uh, the war. They, they uh, let more of their people, people die yeah. Yeah. than any other country. And it's it's crazy that like you don't really hear yeah. about it as much in like high school and stuff as you do with other things. But oh, no, of course not. Yeah. In high school that yeah. you don't hear about. No, you hear, you hear very, very biased version of history from your, your yeah. high school class. It's also so right. funny, though, that because, like, uh, like the Cold War, like, there's uh, a theory that the architect of the Cold War was, like, a Nazi, like, propagandist after, like, after the war. After the war ended, like, uh, they basically changed sides to the states, and then they, yep. like, propaganda, uh, provide propaganda against the, against the USSR. That is easy to believe because we know I, the I U.S. took a bunch it. of Nazis to be like scientists and shit and to like run like death squads in Latin America. Mm. Like the U.S. allied with Nazi Germany before the war and allied with Nazis after the war. They did not have a problem working with them. It's fine. No, they, they did not. Oh, sorry. OK, let's get back to. Sorry, the getting a, way off topic here. But, yeah. about. Uh, <laughs> so November 10th. 1943, November of that year was the worst month of pure starvation of the famine. Um, so authorities within the colony managed to put their pleas for aid before the war cabinet again. So again, the viceroy generals, other people who are in India that are British are saying, please send food. The people here are dying. So 
I feel like they were less racist uh, because they gave a fuck about the people around them dying. Mm. Um, and they begged for 50,000 tons of wheat by the end of December. Mm. And then the same amount, 50,000 tons each month, uh, every month going forward. Now, the day of the meeting, Prof wrote Churchill a letter saying the quantity suggested a very small amount as compared with India's total consumption of over 4 million shipments we have already decided to make. The storage of food is likely to be endemic in a country where the population has always increased until only bare subsistence is possible. In such circumstances, small local shortages or crop failures must cause acute distress. After the war, India can spend her huge hordes of sterling on buying food and thus increase the population still more. But so long as the war lasts or high birth rates may impose a heavy strain on this country, which is not few with the Asiatic detachment, the pressure of a growing population, unlimited supplies of food. So what he's trying to say as a social Dar Darwinist is that... Um, you know, we gotta let these uh these Indians die out first before we start sending more. If we send more food, they're gonna breed more. They're gonna they're gonna fuck like bunnies, and they're gonna put themselves in this position again. Yeah, and we yeah. aren't helping them. We're hurting them if we send this food. Such yeah. su such similar logic to like uh, I think like you're saying before, like cutting welfare and shit. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh no, that's what this is what they need. Mm. Just well, it seems used to be a psychopath. It seems to me like what he's trying to say is that like he's trying to say that like that. If we like limit their food to this much, there will only be this much. So like they're he's like he's like using it as like a way of like population control. Yeah, it's like a weird form of eugenics, you know, whatever. You know, what whatever's whatever's I mean, Yeah, covered. this this is violence. Yeah. This is what this is like what the US does when it sanctions countries, you know. This is what this is punishing the poor, like in mm -hmm. this case, for like not really any political reason aside from just pure racism. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite disgusting. But also just really making sure you have a security net and another security net and another security net and another security net. Yeah, it's like at that point, like maybe some other people need some nets. All right, stop hogging yeah. all the nets. Yeah. All right? Give me some nets. Give me, give me some <laughs> of that net. I want some fucking net, bro. Give me some of that net. All right, I want to. But yeah, so so basically they're saying like once we pay India back, they're going to be able to mm -hmm. buy all their food and fuck like bunnies and make all the people. But we don't need to do that now. So oh, I had some shit about Reverend Thomas Malthus, uh, who was an 18th century reverend who believed that famine was a natural positive check on the population of peoples. Okay, so Lindemann was a huge fan of uh, someone named Reverend Thomas Malthus, who was an 18th century reverend, who believed um, it, it's just like survival of the fittest sort of situation at this point. Um, if people die out, it's because it's that's what God wanted as well. <laughs> yeah. But also famine is a great way to just like keep the population under control. And it's really great to keep the population under control when they're brown people that you don't give a fuck about. Yeah. Um, Jesus Christ. Yeah. All right. I'm going to quote the Scientific American. Uh, so the entwined worldview of Malthus and Darwin provided an explanation of beguiling, sorry, explanation of beguiling to Victorian elites, not only for the evolution of species, but for the ordering of society. The quote evolutionists will not hesitate to affirm the nation with the highest ideals that would succeed Muse uh, uh, Severolo, uh, who is like a, was one of the heroes that Winston Churchill had, uh, had created in the late 1890s during his sojourn in India. Conversely, an excess of compassion could perpetuate the debilitating characteristics of defeated people, imperiling the great good in 1881. Um, this is the report by the government of India on preceding famines concluded that the poorest Indians were the worst affected by such calamities. And if relief measures were to prevent their deaths, they would continue to breed, making the survivors more penurious. So death came as a deliverance to those that nature had chosen to discard. This is what they believed, or Lindemann believed, the prof. So Churchill uh, corroborated Malthus's perspective writing of an 1898 Indian plague when, this is a quote that Churchill has, like a philosopher may watch and move the destruction of some of those superfluous millions whose life must of necessity be devoid of pleasure. And that's just assuming that Indians don't have a pleasureful life because you're not an Indian and you don't understand their ways. Yeah. Um, so... Mm -hmm. So from Scientific American, in a memo to Churchill, Frederick Lindemann suggested that the Bengal famine arose... Guys, these people the wrote the Kama Sutra. They were having fun. <laughs> yeah, clearly, right? Look how bendy they are. You know, they're, just... they're, they're bendy people. But yeah, sorry, so... Um... Racist. Okay, I'm not going <laughs> to... Cut that out. That's the weirdest I fucking... I think Don't I'm going to keep that in because of how funny put, that is. Put that on like the promo clip. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're, bendy, they're such a bendy people. Um, uh, Indians are bendy people. Yeah. You, you sound like Ron Swanson. <laughs> so, okay, so for a scientific American again, in a memo to Churchill, Frederick Lindemann suggested that the Bengal famine arose from crop failure and high birth rate. He admitted to mention that the calamity also derived from India's support role as a supplier to the Allied war effort and that the colony was not being permitted to spend uh, its sterling reserves or even get them, or employ its own ship to get food in, uh, to get sufficient food in. And that, by his M Malthusian logic, Britain should have been the first to starve out, but was being sustained by food imports that were six times larger than the one and a half million tons that the government of India had requested for the coming year. So at this point, England has six times as much food than what India has asked for, but India has a higher population. And England is this frozen island covered in rain that does not need yeah. all this food. Um, That's fucked. Okay. So, yeah. So they're stockpiling. The War Council did agree to send 150 tons, finally, of grain over the course of three months to help out the situation. But they only agreed to this when the famine was at its worst level near the end of 1943. By that time, it was already kind of too late, you know? Uh, can I show you guys a picture? Um, and this is a trigger warning for anyone who's sensitive to seeing starving people. But uh, okay, this is uh, what uh, my people looked like. I think it's just a Google search, but like, let's see. This is um. Oh boy! Can you see that? Mm, yeah, I can see that. That's gross. That's insane. It's like a Holocaust Those picture. Are... Or something. Yeah, like it's just ribs. People shouldn't look like that. Uh. Share another one tab. Um, that's disturbing. That's the same one. Yeah, that's the same one. <laughs> oh boy! Oh boy! Like, uh, like that one was rough. They put up the same one again. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, geez. Here, this is a family. Oh man! Wow! Like. Yeah, so this is why the Viceroy and the generals and all the other English people who are in India are like, please send food, please send help, because the people who are alive look like that. And that's a that's a rough go. Oh, yeah. And uh, and there, there were so many corpses, people would just walk over them at that point because you just kind of got used to it. Uh, but For no reason. They had the food. They weren't even using it. They're just holding on to it because Churchill had a psycho friend who like whispered in his ear yeah and this is a woman with her two dead children and also i don't want to do, absolve churchill of all blame it's also his fault he's also yeah. a fucking piece of shit for this anyway it's a it's a lot of gruesome stuff if you you know if you keep yeah. going it'll like, keep awful yeah. awful pictures like uh, on par with holocaust like uh liberation camps like or yeah. photos of you know yeah which is around the exact holocaust same time period. that this mm -hmm. is happening this is the exact same time period this, yeah. it's it's so disgusting how uh winston churchill had his entire reputation like washed clean after something like this it is yeah like reprehensible that everyone thinks this guy's legit you know he's not legit i thought it was legit i had a picture of him up yeah We're well, at, least you stole, at least you stole it though you're kind of yeah. like taking something yeah. back yeah. You, de you decolonized your classroom <laughs> But like no, I mean it's it's brutal. You know what it reminds me of? Uh, remember uh, Rudy Giuliani uh, after 9/11? Uh, yeah. And uh, he was like the mayor of New York City at the time, and he just like stepped up to the plate and was like, "Guys, I'm going to be with you. It's a hard time right now." And everyone was like, "Oh my God, he, this is America's mayor." That was like his nickname. This is America's no, mayor. Serious. The dude was a fucking piece of shit, horrible mayor, racist, sexist, racist like, piece of shit, piece of shit. Yeah. Asshole. Only now, people since he's like been associated with Trump, are people now being like, "Oh, wait, what? What happened to him? He used to be cool. No, 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 no. Yeah. He, he never was cool. No, he, he was never, never was. cool. He was just associated with like a time when you, everyone felt really patriotic. That's fucking Winston Churchill. He's he was uh the the face of World War II, True. and everyone was just you like, World War II is like honestly like listen, I'm like a pretty left wing guy. I'm I, I'm not into uh, war in general, you know. Uh, but like World War II is a good war. World War II is a rare war that's not fought just for like imperial interests. Like yeah. World War II is a war that was fought to, to fight against fascism and like, you know, concentration camps and shit. Like that's a, that's a good war. There's a reason why that's the one we talk about all the time. Cause it's the no, one I, that we were actually on the right side of. Yeah. I think that like in a lot of ways, like <clears throat> I, 
I'm not even sure people like were really thinking about that when that war was happening, or if they're doing it like in more of like self interest. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or then it was just like so happened to be yeah. at the end of, at the end oh, of it. Yeah. They're like they're like, look, all this happened here. Yes, so yo, you're like, right. Well, you know what? That's why we did it. Exactly. Yo, you're you. totally right. You're totally right. Yeah, I know they they didn't do it because it was the right war. Like they did no. it because of imperial, like you know, interests. Who gets to control Europe, basically? Yeah. Uh, they, but after it's over, they're like, oh, turns out, like these guys were like fucking fascists. Yeah. Oh my god, that's why we did it, guys. We're noble. We're the good guys. Let's tell ourselves that story again and again and again for the rest of time. Yeah. Like World War One. Sorry, that's a bullshit war. That's a complete bullshit war. That was not a war for the, the people. No one was fighting for people's freedom in World War One. World no. War Two. They were fighting against Hitler. That guy was a fucking like yeah. monster. He was. He uh, really but because Winston Churchill was like the guy with the cigar and like the fucking, you know, champagne. And he was like, oh, yes, we will fight them on the beaches. We will fight them on the the, the other part of the place. We'll fight them in the even a the different part on the same battlefield. I don't I don't remember the quote, something like that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> like he had all these like epic quotes and shit. And, you know, he seemed mm. like badass. <laughs> Study history. That was yeah. a quote of his. That's why I stole That's it. I love history, That's but right, I didn't yeah. have history. verbatim. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no. Now we're like, this guy rules. No, he fucking sucks. Look what he did to India. This guy it was a fucking monster. Yeah, yeah. that was they, a white okay, supremacist. So it is not an exaggeration to say. You read those or uh, those quotes from his like diaries or or whatever. I, I guess we saw that in the, the video. Oh, I, I have more coming up. But yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Because yeah, yeah okay. like that that shit. He is a irredeemable monster. I'm sorry. Sorry we, to, we to burst your bubble, uh, people listening. Yeah, we're yeah. losing all of our, our one fan that we know. We, <laughs> we started the day. I don't know how many real fans we have, uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so here's the thing. You were saying being on the right side of history. This is one time Canada was on the right side because Canada heard about India not having enough food and That's offered right. to send mm. 100,000 tons of grain. To gift to India, not like a loan or anything. This was just going to be, yeah. this is for you, just take it. And then Churchill heard about this and said, oh, we can't afford to send those ships out. Come on, Churchill. What the fuck? Yeah. And then Canada see. was like, wait, we already filled a ship with 10,000 tons of grain and it's going to go there. Let's just, let's just go there. So the Canadians are really pushing to send it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 10,000 tons of grain and was waiting to take off from a port. Uh, from like the northeast coast of Canada and was going to sail down to India. And then Churchill just fought against letting it deliver the food aid the entire way. Uh, and even though it was already loaded and he was uh, fighting against it on the grounds that sending the grain all the way from Canada would be inefficient. Yeah. Now, not everyone in the War Council obviously agreed with him because like I said, some of these people were decent human beings or like had a soul. Um, yeah. And someone, there was a member on the War Council and he wrote this. He said, the trouble with Winston... No, the trouble is that Winston so dislikes India and all to do with it that he can see nothing but the mere waste of shipping space involved in the longer journey. Like that says it all. Like right even there. among other like rich, white, elite, like fucking <laughs> leaders, they were like, yo, Churchill's a bit racist, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Churchill's yeah. a little fucked up about fucking like the global <laughs> south. You guys notice that? Yeah, and like he like, went bro, that doesn't, like, this is it gonna cost you more to said. yeah. <laughs> It's like it's all something that was hidden and whispered. Like this is a quote that he wanted out there, just being like, "But like, no one can criticize Churchill at this time in England because he's doing so much. He's the father of freedom and some shit." Mm -hmm. Actually, that's not what it was. He actually called. I'll look it up. Uh, I don't know. The Darkest Hour. <laughs> that's what, that's what it was called. That was the Gary Oldman movie. Anyway, a piece of shit playing a piece of shit. Oh, that's cool. He was a, <laughs> he was a yeah. Gary Oldman. When Gary Oldman had some bad opinions. He didn't. He never fucking genocided anyone. He became Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill. He got the honorific of Sir. Fucking. Oh, oh, sir. When is he? Don't. Are you born with that honorific? Isn't that he just what like a waiter it. calls you? It, it, you know, you have to do that thing with the swords, like Jamie Lannister does. Oh, I dub yeah. the. Oh, it's a knight thing. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. Okay, okay. Yeah. So when you call, um, when somebody calls me Sir, I should be like, excuse me, that's stolen valor. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I've saying. never been knighted, have I? I actually made a whole point because it's Pride Month and like you know people are looking for like non-gendered things to call people. It's like what's non-gendered? Was an ungendered way of saying sir or ma'am? And I said excuse me because the only time anyone's calling me ma'am is if they're gonna say you're causing a scene. You know the Simpsons quote? Absolutely mm. that. So just mm -hmm. call everyone excuse me and everything should be fine. Um, but okay, so 
Okay, so 10,000 grain, tons of grain. Uh, so Leopold Amory was the one who said that, you know, fuck this guy, essentially. Uh, now, at the same time, the United Kingdom was enjoying a very healthy grain surplus. No shit. And yeah. when the famine at Bengal was at its deadliest, Winston Churchill was informed that they had a very significant surplus of grain, which he cheerfully advised uh, uh, the like the British people uh, that the grain should be given to chicken farmers. Okay, to feed to the chickens so that the British population can enjoy more eggs. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's the starving people, but feed it to the chickens because I'd like some more eggs with my, I want an egg Benny. You know, like, yeah. fuck off. To be fair, those are delicious. I know. <laughs> For eggs, they are pretty great. I don't eggs like Benny. eggs. Benny. I love it. But you know how to I make an egg penny? Like you need to use the yolks to yeah, make poach, the, the yeah, hollandaise. Yeah, poach it. It's tough. You, oh, and the hollandaise. Yeah, yeah. And the hollandaise is just like mm -hmm. you waste the white. So think about how wasteful that is of the egg. And Yeah, that's egg. true. That's true. 1944 came about. More shipping and more grain was dedicated towards building a stockpile for an invasion of the Balkans that Churchill hoped would liberate Greece. So again, not sending it to India. So this stockpile did not end up being used. When the campaign failed, the War Council considered having the tens of thousands of tons of food on hand to save white people from possible famine was worth far more than stopping an actual famine in India. And contrary to the prof's expectations, the famine did indeed hit, and it hit hard, and millions of people began to starve. The prof's and like, oh, whoops. Wah, wah. Pobody's perfect. My dog is whining. Uh, oh, the fucking prof. <laughs> This guy, I tell you. Oh man, I didn't know that when he see was such a piece of shit. Yeah, me either. To be honest, I knew he was a piece of shit, but dang. Oh man. Yeah. The deaths from starvation actually peaked at the end of 1943, but throughout 1944, the weakness brought on by chronic malnutrition led to tons of diseases. If your body is weak because it's hungry, it can't fight off things mm -hmm. as easily, like even mm -hmm. the common cold. But the rates of malaria went through the roof. Um, malaria rates in 1944 went up, up to, it jumped 125% above normal. Dysentery and diarrhea that brought on, like, like that happened by eating rotten food because you're desperate and you're trying to eat something uh, also claimed a lot of lives. And so did cholera and smallpox. And cholera is also apparently a diarrhea disease. Did you know that? I'm learning so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you shit yourself to death. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. I always thought it was a coughing thing. I don't know why. Um, so by the end of the famine, uh, roughly 3 million Indians, mostly in Bengal, so mostly Bengali people like my people, uh, were dead. The ones that survived are obviously famine proof, which loops back to the whole why I can't lose weight easily thing. <laughs> like, but you're the, um, you're the real victim in all this, Rush. <laughs> So this is basically, I would say, is a war crime. Yeah, one hundred percent. So, except where they were even it, like war, like they weren't even at war, really. Well, they—I mean, they were at war in the sense that they were sending like some Indians off to fight. It's crime um, against humanity for sure, for sure. Absolutely, like Definitely. one of the one of the worst, one of the worst ones ever. Okay, so uh, I'm on an enormous scale, how many people? How many people died? Like two million or something? This is three million people. Three million. Three million mm -hmm. people. Come on, um, right, right there. That's like half of a, uh, you know, Holocaust. That yeah. is, yeah, that is, that is half of a Holocaust. And uh, like, actually, the, like, the actual Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the yeah. war cabinet did eventually. It happened in, in a shorter amount of time, too, than the actual Holocaust. I think it was around the same time. But uh, it was like quicker that more people were dying faster, I mean. Uh, I in the sense that they, I, I don't really know what the math would be for that uh, because. Yeah, I, mean, I think doing that sort of math would just be soul crushing too. Where it's just exactly, like, yeah, how exactly. quickly can we kill somebody? Which is just yeah. like fucking super awful to think of. Mm -hmm. Starving mm -hmm. someone is a slow way to go. Um, yeah. And that is the way this was done here. So the war cabinet did eventually agree to send an additional 200,000 tons of wheat and barley to India, but it didn't arrive quick enough to actually make a difference or save many lives. Um, all the stockpiles that Churchill and Lindemann had built up for Greece and Italy were, and for England, uh, were useless. They're mostly useless. Um, and obviously the prof didn't show any sort of emotion about it. He didn't give any fucks. 
because no. uh, he does not give any fucks about this anybody. Guy is a like sociopath. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm saying autistic, and that's not fair. He's actually just a sociopath. Yeah. That is absolutely true. <laughs> um. So now, obviously, there are historians that always uh, stand. For Winston Churchill, there are a lot of simps for Churchill. I stand. Boris He's, Boris Johnson was like, I stand. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's a, that's a from here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's a there's a professor whose name is uh, what's his fucking name? <laughs> professor Richard M. Lang in the states. One of the biggest stands, if not the biggest stand. Anytime there's an article or anything like, let's say this podcast. Dear Winston, up, I wrote you, but you still ain't calling. <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> he did. But. <laughs> Yeah, you can Google what he has to say. My podcast isn't about to. I drank a fifth of champagne for dinner. Dare me to drive? Okay. (laughs) Don't even Um, tell me it wasn't worth it. I made the I made the last Brexit worth it. (laughs) Oh no, last Brexit. Oh fuck, whatever. But yeah, so so here's the thing. Richard Lang, Professor Richard Lang, is it, he teaches at a, a right wing conservative university called Hillside College in Michigan, and um, great sounds like a good. He school. always has two quotes ready to go, and I bear I, I was so angry at just reading them that I didn't even write them properly. But um, <laughs> one right. of the things that he has to, to prove that that Churchill wasn't a racist. He, he has these defenses just always ready to go mm. and one of the things that he wrote was that they sent a whole shit ton of barley to india but indians wouldn't eat the barley there's no nothing to corroborate this there's no proof anywhere online that says that the indians uh, were opposed to barley in any sort of way that doesn't sound they're like it's starving. True. they're eating yeah. rotten food and getting dysentery Oof. that doesn't sound like it happened no um but yeah, so there, uh, more and more research is being done now, and and it's coming becoming more mainstream, and people are beginning to really find out that Winston Churchill did a bunch of policy things that really fucked Bengal and India over, and and turned Bangladesh over, uh, Pakistan over, just the entire like just the jewel. Cruelty over. for the sake of cruelty, pointless. Yeah. Gave them no advantage in the war. Just p- very passive. At least they felt uh, comfortable was- with themselves. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like they felt mm-hmm. good about it. So, and, yeah. and so there's an article that Al Jazeera published, uh, and the, there's a quote that it says the Bengal famine of 1943 is uh, estimated to have killed up to three million people, and was not caused by drought, but instead was the result of a uh, quote complete policy failure of the then Prime Minister, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. A recent study has said the study published in the Journal of Geophysical Research. Uh, letters provided scientific backing for arguments that Churchill's policies played a significant role in contributing to the catastrophe. The researchers analyzed the soil moisture, so they're being really scientific about it, soil moisture database over the years 1870 to 2016 to reconstruct agricultural droughts. The researchers studied six major famines in the subcontinent between 1873 and 1943 and concluded that the Bengal famine was the only famine that does not appear to be linked directly to soil moisture deficit and crop failures. The only one. Hmm. So... There's a, yeah, I mean, you know, like there's, there have been many famines and many like uh, debatably, you know, man made famines, right? Like there's the Holodomor in Ukraine from uh, USSR. Um, there's the, uh, the, the well, I don't know, there, there, there are a bunch, but um, this one in particular is like completely on purpose and yeah. there's no debate about it. Like you don't get to be like, well, also, you know, it was tough yeah. back then. No, no, they had the food and they decided not to give it to them. Yeah. They took food from another, them. Sorry. I, I think there was another quote that the professor, not the prof, Lindemann, but professor or whatever fuckface his name is. Yeah. Um, professor Fuckface. What's his name? The prof? Professor Lang. Oh, this um, guy. Right, right. Uh, where apparently, uh, like, Churchill wrote somewhere that he felt for India and their plight. But here's an actual quote. From Churchill that I think would negate that and this is something he said if the short like this is what he said about the food shortages in India oh yeah it was the telegram from Delhi um, from again another British person who's working in India who is desperate to feed the Indians that he sees around them and he simply asked why isn't Gandhi dead yet that's it wow. that was the whole line that's why that's isn't impressive. Gandhi dead yet and it's just like Fucking fuck. And this guy's a hero. This guy's considered a hero. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this guy's uh he sucks. <clears throat> he's, he's the worst. Sure. The guy who's like, global warming's real. Well, how did I make this snowball? <laughs> yeah. Or like it snows in like June. And they're like, oh, global warming, huh? Not really. 
sounds like Sorry, a global for, for holding life, to me. Yeah. Oh man, so that was that was a lot longer than I meant for it to be. Can I just can I send you guys something to watch uh, for like right now? Sure. Yeah, can you share it to the thing? It's oh. recording, so. Um. Oh, actually, yeah, yeah. Actually, okay. Let me do that instead. Uh, how do I do this? Present? No. Yes, present must be right. Present a window. Use a tab. Now presenting this window. Cool. Let me just accept my Twitter here. Uh, this is a clip from uh, British. Uh, I don't know, fucking Piers Morgan uh, thing where they brought this oh, guy nice. on because uh, see that like <laughs> that nerdy looking dude on the right? He yeah. had a tweet that said Winston Churchill was a white supremacist mass murder. So they brought him on for like an easy target and Can he yell at him? just fucking crushes it. Let's hear it. Like, right, so. Winston Churchill's life and career uh, came down to he is a white supremacist mass murderer interspose your tweet, tweet with a number, I think seven or eight, uh, uh, clapping, clapping emojis, emojis applauding, applauding your own <laughs> genius and describing Sir Winston, Winston in that manner. What a fuckhead this guy yeah, is. So, yeah. so let's make a comparison. Pierce, you're a, a sensitive soul. Yesterday you accused me of being a racist for pointing out that you look like honey glazed gammon. gammon. If you want an example <laughs> yeah. of real racism, you just have to look to Churchill. He talked about his belief in the triumph of the Aryan race. He hated Indians with a passion. He said they were a beastly people with a beastly religion. When a famine broke out, three million people starved to death. So that's why I Said that he was a white supremacist. I said mass murderer because he always advocated the most violent, the most destructive option. He used poisoned gas against Kurds, against Afghans. Mm -hmm. He was a strong supporter of Britain's concentration camps in the Boer War, where 28,000 people, women and children, died. He's always advocated the use of aerial bombardments in what he described as terror bombing campaigns. In fact, his own cabinet had to stop him when he was uh, when he was in the cabinet in the 20s. Cabinet colleagues had to stop him from from bombing protesters in Ireland. Winston Churchill was voted the greatest Britain of the last century for a reason. <laughs> is that people what believe a douche that he have. almost single-handedly, through the power of his rhetoric in World War II, saved this country from the Nazis. Again, you laugh. That sneering little laugh. that won the war. It the was the soldiers, the sailors, yeah. you and you the airmen who won the war. Right, and they okay. voted him out when they came home. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, love that oh. last line. That also, so it's good. one of those things where, like, it, it, yeah, no, Winston Churchill did not win the war. The soldiers won the war, and they voted him out when they got back home. Amazing. And also, Pierce Morgan can't argue with like like soldiers. Like, it's just like not in his blood. I think because like it's yeah. he's very pro military. Um, okay, mm -hmm. uh, I think that was uh, the end of it. Any final thoughts from anybody? Fuck Winston Churchill. Fuck Winston Churchill. Uh, Fuck when he see. Fuck uh, co settler colonialism and right. colonialism. I think and Kevin's colonialism. muted. Yeah. I'm just gonna say that this whole conversation has been soul crushing, and yeah. I, can't, I can't wait to do it again. <laughs> yeah, you guys awesome. are. This is gonna be your old thing, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. So next time, Kevin's gonna take the reins. Uh, and uh, yeah, James, is there anything you wanna plug? Yeah, sure. I'll um, I'll plug. I actually have a a, a YouTube channel that is kind of uh, maybe fans of the show would enjoy. Uh, I do leftist propaganda on YouTube uh, under Chill Goblin. So uh, check that out. Cool. Is it youtube.com slash chill goblin? Spell uh, yeah, down? actually, yeah. Chill goblin, C-H-I-L-L-G-O-B-L-I-N. Chill goblin. Nice. Amazing. Okay, thank you so much for being here. Again, I'm Rush Kazi. And I'm Kevin Schwanda. And, and I'm guess... James Island. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> uh, Kevin will do the next story. Uh, thanks for watching, listening, however you're doing this. Bye, almost Indian. Bye. Follow Bye. us on the internet. Not at all Indian.